Well, if you uh, have a Bible, and I hope you or uh, somebody around you does that you can look on with, I invite you to open with me to Esther chapter 4. In the Old Testament, feel free to use table of contents if you need to, but find Esther chapter 4. I mean, let me read it to you. We're going we're to just start at the end of the chapter, verse 13. I'll read through the very end of the chapter. I want us to read this passage, and then we'll, we'll fill in some of the blanks and think about it together. Esther chapter 4, verse 13. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa, and hold a fast on my behalf, and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. Oh, uh, this is quite a story. Now, now, here's why this text comes to my mind when I think about McLean Bible Church. I believe that what Mordecai said to Esther in what we just read ref reflects realities that are true in and around McLean Bible Church right now. And I believe how Esther responded to these realities is exactly how God is calling McLean Bible Church to respond to these realities. So let me show this to you. I want to show you three realities that Mordecai is communicating to Esther in this passage that I believe are realities in and around this church right now. So you might write them down. What is, think about what is Mordecai communicating to Esther? Well, number one, he's telling Esther the need around you is urgent. The need around you is urgent, Esther. Now, let me, let me fill in some blanks, give you a little context behind what we just read. You look at Old Testament history, God's people, the Jewish people, were exiled from Jerusalem and scattered among the Babylonians under the rule of the Babylonians. Then the Babylonians were taken over by the Persians. So at this point in this text, the Persians were ruling over the Jews. And in the chapter right before what we just read, there was a guy named Haman who persuaded the king of Persia to make an edict, declaring that on a certain day, all the Jewish people should be killed. And that's what the king did. The king of Persia decreed the annihilation of all the Jews. Now, meanwhile, Esther, who was a Jewish woman, was the queen. But the king didn't know she was Jewish. And Esther hadn't yet heard about the edict. So Esther's cousin Mordecai sent her a message in the palace, told her what was going on, and said she needed to try and stop this. Well, Esther said, problem is, I haven't seen the king for a while, and I'm not scheduled to see him anytime soon. Right before the verses we just read, verse 11 of chapter 4, she sent a message to Mordecai, said, everybody knows that if any man or woman goes to the king without being invited, only one thing happens. They die. So for Esther, so as she said, it would be, it's against the law. It would be risking her life to even try and see the king, much less ask him to totally change an edict he's made. So Esther sent that message to Mordecai. Then Mordecai sent the message we just read. Mordecai said, Esther, you don't realize this is urgent for all of us. You can't ignore this. What he said, he started in verse 13. Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace, you will escape any more than all the other Jews. The, this need is urgent, Mordecai says. You can't ignore it. You can't just go on with life in the Persian palace. So that's the first thing. Then the second thing he tells her, the God over you, he says, is sovereign. The God over you is sovereign. He's in control. In other words, Esther, and all that's going on here, don't be mistaken. Things are not out of control. God is in control. This is one of the things I love most about this passage amidst this urgent need among the Jews. See the steadfast confidence in Mordecai's faith. He says, if you keep silent at this time, listen to this phrase. He says, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. Relief and deliverance will rise. He says, Mordecai is confident 
of that. Mordecai knows. We're talking about the people of God in the Old Testament, the Jewish people, the people of God with the promises of God. And God had promised to keep them and preserve them and sustain them. And Mordecai knew this. Mordecai knew that God would not let his people be annihilated. Mordecai knew that God would save them. God is sovereign. So Mordecai says, Esther, put all this together. Do you realize what God has done? In his sovereignty, God has put you in the place and position you are in for such a time as this. This is no accident, Esther. It's no accident that you, a Jewish woman, are the queen. That you, a Jewish woman, are in the king's palace at this moment. Which leads to the third reality Mordecai is communicating. Esther, the need around you is urgent, the God over you is sovereign, and the opportunity before you is momentous. It's huge. This moment is significant, and God has sovereignly set you up for it. Now, this is the reality I love most about the book of Esther. Did you know that the book of Esther never mentions the name of God? If you read through the book of Esther, you won't ever see the name of God. And people have practically criticized this book as a result. But this is where I I want you to see that though the name of God is not mentioned in this Bible book, the fingerprints of God are all over this Bible book. The the book of Esther, just picture it, it's like a divine drama with cosmic coincidences at every turn. Think about it. After all, how how does... Esther become queen in the first place? Well, one day, Queen Vashti just so happens to upset her husband. And he just so happens to cast her out, which just so happens to create the need for a new queen. Enter Esther, who just so happens to be a beautiful Jewish woman, who among all the other women just so happens to find favor in the king's eyes. And Esther just so happens to be Mordecai's cousin who just so happens one day to hear about a plot to kill the king. And Mordecai just so happens to tell Esther, who tells the king, and the king's life is saved. Mordecai's act is written down in a book, but it just so happens that for some reason he isn't honored at that point. Hmm. All of that leads to Haman, an evil man, who just so happens to become prominent in the kingdom. He's the one who wants to kill all the Jews, and he hates Mordecai, Because Mordecai won't bow down to Haman like everybody else. That makes Haman mad. And he decides he's going to have the king kill Mordecai. Haman has gallows built for Mordecai. And his plan is to go into the king the next morning and ask for Mordecai to be killed. But it just so happens that that night the king can't sleep. And he says, somebody read a book to me. And it just so happens that the guy who goes to get a bedtime story for the king, out of all the books he could have pulled off the shelf, he picks the one that tells the story of how Mordecai saved the king's life. The king says, did we honor this man, Mordecai? And the servant says, no. So the king decides that's what he's going to do first thing in the morning. So just as soon as the sun rises, as the king is ready to honor Mordecai, guess who just so happens to walk in the room? Haman. So the king just so happens to say, hey man. (laughs) Couldn't wait for that moment. (laughs) So the king says, hey man, how do you think I should honor somebody who's super special? Haman thinks the king's talking about him. So Haman says, put royal robes on him and parade him around for everybody to praise. And the king says, that's a great idea. Do that for Mordecai. And all of a sudden, Haman finds himself robing up the guy he wanted to hang, leading him through the land for everybody to praise. But Haman still got some hope because Queen Esther has invited him to a banquet with just her and the king. So he's thinking he's pretty special until he gets to the banquet. And Queen Esther says, King, we've got a problem. You've decreed the destruction of the Jews and your wife's a Jew. He says, King says, who in the world made me do that? And Esther says, 
<laughs> the king is furious. He leaves the room. Haman falls on his face before Esther, pleading for mercy. The king just so happens to come back in at that time. He thinks Haman's mistreating his wife and says, that's it. I'm hanging you. And ha, it just so happens some gallows had recently been built. And within hours, Haman says hello to them. You can't write a script any better than this. <laughs> Do you realize, do you realize what the book of Esther is teaching us about history? God has the whole thing rigged. And he's rigged it for a reason. Get the picture. God is the sovereign king who in the midst of a world of urgent need desires to show his salvation, his love, his mercy, his glory. And he puts his people in certain positions, in certain places at certain times for the accomplishment of his sovereign purpose. And that is the reality I see when I look out at McLean Bible Church right now. Follow this. Follow this with me. So just think about it. each of these realities. In this text applied to this people. You. In this room and other campuses at this time. With Mordecai, I would say without hesitation that the need around McLean is urgent. The need around surrounding this church is urgent. Sure, it's not the same as the Jews and Esther in this text, but I see parallels here. I, just picture Esther. She's living in the luxuries of the Persian palace, totally unaware of the edict against the Jews, the urgency of the need around her. Mordecai says, you, you've got to see this. You can't ignore this. She's tempted to ignore it, and I think the same thing if we're not careful, could be said about us. Could be said about this church. This church resides in one of the wealthiest places in the entire world. And if this church is not careful, if we're all not careful, we can live totally unaware of urgent need all around us. We can actually start to convince ourselves that the world looks like this. When it, when it doesn't, it's just so easy for us to forget that we, we live in a world where every single day between 20, 30,000 children die of either starvation or a preventable disease. Every day, 20 to 30,000 kids. We, I don't, we don't even know how to think like this. I mean, if this were happening among us, all of our kids, all of our kids in this church would be gone by tomorrow. Urgent need. I, I think about children right here in Northern Virginia, Maryland, D.C. We can so easily forget that on average, so if averages prove true, then tomorrow, about 100 babies will be aborted in the DMV. Some of them, at least in D.C., in their mother's ninth month of pregnancy. 100 of them tomorrow. And that, that's a conservative estimate. This is urgent need. Like, there are hurting women and dying children right around us right now. I was walking through the lobby here at, at Tyson's. I saw folks from Lily House and others for freedom this Sunday, churches across the country today shining light on the reality that there are more slaves alive right now than any other time in history, many of whom are, are trafficked, kidnapped, bought, sold for sex. You know, I had I'd heard that, but it just seemed so distant to me until I found myself one day in an impoverished village in Nepal, just extremely poor. A, uh, a trafficker had come through that village and promised uh, mom a sizable sum of money if he could take her little girl. He promised to get her daughter a good job where she could make a lot of money and 
come back up and visit and bring money to support her family. So the mom sent her daughter down the mountain and hasn't seen her since. And her daughter's not working a good job. She's living, she's living in a brothel where her precious little spirit has been broken and her body's been drugged and raped repeatedly every single day. I remember reading Luke 10 on that trek and I come to that place where Jesus says the second greatest commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. And I'm just thinking as myself, like, what if this was my daughter? What would, I, what would I do? What would we do if this was our daughter's thing? We'd think that was urgent need. And it's not just far from here. I think of a, a mom and a little girl who I met in Herndon. They fled their country when their husband, dad, was murdered. And now they're renting a tiny room in a rundown apartment. They have no idea where their next meal is going to come from. And I haven't, I haven't even mentioned spiritual need, just the number of people without the gospel, regardless of physical need, the number of people right now who are separated from God all around us, and if nothing changes, the number of people who will spend an eternity in hell when they die, an eternity forever. We're talking about millions of people around Metro Washington millions. I was spending time in D.C. last night just from housing projects to college campuses to clubs seeing so many people in so many places on a Saturday night where there is so little gospel presence. Millions of people in D.C. on top of billions of people around the world. Like I, I just want to say to us, I believe God is saying to us, the need around you is urgent. And just like Esther couldn't ignore it, we can't either. This is something I, I just need to share from my heart, particularly if I might be a pastor here. I, I see in my life, and I see in the church in our culture, a temptation and a tendency to ignore need like this. A temptation, a tendency to pretend like realities like these don't exist. It seems to me sometimes like we've created a whole system of Christianity where we can come into a nice building, we can sit in a cushion chair, supposedly worship, and then walk out and spend the rest of our week living for all this world has to offer us as we ignore urgent spiritual and physical need around us. But this is not what God has called us to. It's not what God has called me to. It's not what God has called you to. It's not what God has called this church to. He's put us in a world of urgent need and we don't have time to play games with our lives. And we, we don't have time to play games in the church. We don't have time to waste our lives in the church coasting through a nice, comfortable Christian spin on the American dream. No, the need around us is great. The need around McLean is great. And the God over McLean and everything else in the world is sovereign. Just as Mordecai said, things in this world are not spinning out of control. Things in this world are ultimately under the control of a sovereign God, a sovereign God who has promised to show, he wants to show his salvation, his justice, his love, his mercy, his glory in a world of need. I was in Psalm 68 this last week in my quiet time. He's, he wants to show himself as father to the fatherless and defender of the weak through his people. He wants to bring freedom to the captive and hope to the oppressed and good news to the poor. God is sovereign. He has a sovereign purpose to save people, to show his mercy to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people group on the planet. And God has put his people in certain positions, in certain places, at certain times for the accomplishment of his sovereign purpose. And if I could be so bold in light of that reality, I would say that the opportunity before McLean is momentous. I'm convinced that God has set this church up in his sovereign design for such a time as this. Nothing that has happened here has happened by accident. You just look, 56 years ago, 1961, God just so happened to bring five families together to start a church where the Bible would be taught and preached in Washington, D.C., it's no accident that years later, God just so happened to save a Jewish kid on drugs from his sin. And God just so happened to bring that kid to serve as a pastoral intern at this church. And that pastoral intern just so happened to come back years later and become the next pastor of 
this church. And it just so happens this church began to grow as its members said, we want to impact lives across Metro Washington with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And who among us could ever recount all the just so happens that led to frontline ministry, reaching all kinds of young adults and access ministry and chill, Jill's house, reaching families of children with intellectual and physical disabilities. All the circumstances have led to planting four other campuses across the Beltway and all kinds of ministries across the city. Nine church plants over the last year, which just so happens to lead to this Sunday where 10,000 or so people are gathering to give God glory in this church across this city, God has done all of that. And the, and, the, and the beauty is, brothers and sisters, that story is not finished. So could it be that in all of that, he's just been setting up more for such a time as this, that now, in the midst of a world of massive urgent need, God has sovereignly placed this church in the nation's capital for the spread of his salvation and the display of his glory in the world like never before. The need around McLean, urgent. The God over McLean, sovereign. And the opportunity before Mo McLean, momentous. I use that word deliberately, momentous, not just because the language like moment for such a time as this, but because that, that word means of great or far-reaching importance or consequence. Oh, see it. God has assembled this group of 10,000 people from 106 different nations. Oh, just think of all the gifts and skills and resources and passions and positions the Lord has entrusted to this church. I, I just think about, I think about two conversations I had yesterday. Just two folks, two out of 10,000. One was with a, a businessman whose job takes him around the world. It's open doors in all kinds of countries where he goes there for work. And as he goes there for work, he's intentionally engaging in ministry. He's going into a lot of countries where it's, there's very little gospel access and he's working to bring the gospel along with him, use the platforms God has given him for the spread of the gospel in those places. He and his wife and their kids started spending their summers in one African country helping train pastors and church leaders with God's word. I said, brother, why are you doing that? You could be spending your summers relaxing in any number of places in the world. And he said, that is not what God put me here to do. The other conversation I think about, precious sister in Christ, a single mom, who came to faith when, when she was younger and found herself walking into a pregnancy center with plans to have an abortion. And a counselor shared the gospel with her and her heart was totally changed. And Christ brought healing to her heart and her family. And now she has three beautiful kids. And five days a week, she comes up here and volunteers with McLean on the move, ministering to other women who have walked through what she has walked through. I just walked away from those two conversations praying, Lord, multiply their number. And that was two people. How about 10,000 people with all the unique ministry opportunities there are in D.C.? 10,000 people like that showing God's justice and mercy across the city and then all the unique opportunities from the city as so many people have positions that take them around the world. Hundreds, even thousands of people scattering to show God's justice and mercy all over the world in a world of urgent spiritual and physical need. The opportunity before this church is momentous. So I exhort you, McLean Bible Church, I exhort you to respond just like Esther did at the end of Esther 4. Did you notice what she did? She, she did two things. She responded in two ways. First, she sought God's face. And that's the first exhortation I would give you from God's word in this church, individually, collectively, as you look at the momentous opportunity he has put before you in this day. Seek his face. Notice, notice the first thing Esther didn't do when she heard this news from Mordecai. The first thing she didn't do was go to work, which is what I think I'd be prone to do. I'm guessing many of you would be the same. We're busy people, particularly in this part of the country. We like, we like to get things done, start working, which is good, but it's not where Esther started, and it's not where 
Any of us, this church needs to start. Esther said, verse 15, Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then she said, I'll go to work. You see, Esther knew what every one of us in this room and other campuses needs to know. It is impossible to do the work of God apart from the power of God. I, I, remember, I remember when I uh, first became pastor of a good-sized church, went to it, and I, I, I said, this church, so many people, so many gifted, talented people, so many resources. Like this church, serious about, about mission, can be a part of shaking the nations for God's glory. And I, I realized real quick that that was a foolish way to think and a foolish way to talk. Because the reality is, it didn't matter how many people there were, how gifted, talented they were, how many resources they had. That church, apart from the power of the Holy Spirit of God, would do nothing to shake nations for his glory. In fact, the exact opposite would be true. This church could have the least number of people, least gifted, talented people, and the least amount of resources. And that church, under the power of God's Holy Spirit, could shake the nations for his glory. Do we believe this? Like, do you believe that, do you believe that God can do more in the next month in and through this church under the power of his spirit than he could in the next hundred years if we were dependent on what we bring to the table? This is so different from the way we think. We think. Let's pull together all our resources. We can make a difference. Well, before that, let's go to God and seek his resources, that which only he can give. So I urge you, especially even in this conversation about next pastor teacher in this way or that way, put the focus, always put the focus on where it needs to be. And that's not on this pastor or that pastor. It's on the power of God seeking his face. Even if the Lord does lead me in this way, like all I want to do is lead us continually to throw aside all damning dependence on natural ability and human ingenuity and plead for God to do in and through this church what only God can do, what can only be explained by his hand. We don't want to be a part of that which can be explained. Well, this person, the pastor, this leader's over here. No, we want to be a part of something that when, when fruit is coming for the, for in the world amidst urgent need, that it's clear only God could have done that. Only, only God. So seek, seek his face. And as you do, surrender your lives. Surrender your lives. Urgent need, sovereign God, momentous opportunity. Surrender your lives. Esther says in verse 16, let's pray, let's fast. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. What a statement. Esther's holding nothing back here. She realized this, is, this could cost her her life. This is everything. She says, I believe God has put me in this time, in this place for his purpose. So I surrender my life and I say, use me for the accomplishment of your purpose. Oh, that God would instill that heart in every member of McLean Bible Church. I yieldedness to him with your position, all your possessions, all gifts of grace that God has given you to say it's, it's all on the table. Surrender it all to you. I believe you've put me in this time, this place. Just, just, oh, would you believe this? Would you believe right where you're sitting not just the person beside you, in front of you, behind you, just right where you're sitting, that God has put you where you are for a reason. That you are not in your job by accident. That you're not living where you are right now 
by accident. That you're not surrounded by the people you're surrounded by by accident. That you're not a part of this church by accident. That God has sovereignly ordained all of these things, puts you in all kinds of different places for such a time as this, in a world of urgent need. He's opened up opportunity for you with all you have to be a demonstration of his salvation, his love, and his justice, and his mercy. Right where you live and wherever he might lead you around the world. And you would see that as momentous, like God desires to do great, far-reaching things through you. I, I exhort you, seek his face. Surrender your life. And that, that may sound like, well, that's, that sounds pretty, pretty bold. I mean, to say everything, like all my possessions and all, all this, like I'm surrendering it all. But this, this is not, you might, you might think, I don't know if I'm ready to do that. I just want to remind you, this is the essence of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. This is not like a certain level of spiritual maturity. This is initial Discipleship. Jesus, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. This is the essence of what it means to be a follower of Christ, to say, you're Lord of my life. And if it strikes any fear in you to say that to the Lord, to say with my future, my plans, my dreams, my possessions, everything I have, my family, I give it all to you, use it however you want. If there's any fear in you when it comes to saying that to the Lord, surrendering your life to the Lord, I would just encourage you to remember who you're surrendering your life to. He is good. He's so good. He loves you so much. He loves you so much that he has died on a cross for your sins. He's risen from the dead in victory over sin. He's ascended to heaven. He's promised you eternal life with him. If you can trust him to save you from eternal damnation, surely you can trust him to lead you on this earth. And not just to lead you, but to satisfy you every step of the way. McLean Bible Church, the need around you is urgent. The God over this church is sovereign, and the opportunity before this church is momentous. So may this church seek his face, and individually and collectively surrender your lives to whatever he has for his glory in the days ahead.